Okay, so on to names and formulas. This is going to be really important for the rest of the semester. You do have to know what names mean, how I can figure out a formula from the name, um, that kind of stuff. So we're going to start with ionic compounds. They're actually the most complicated ones. Um, so we know that ionic compounds have a cation and an anion. Okay, so there's a couple rules for their formulas. So we know they contain a cation aka the positive thing, and an anion. Okay, so they're only going to have two things in them, cation, anion, okay? Um, their formulas always have to be empirical, must be empirical. What does that mean? That just means it is reduced as much as possible. So like if it's Na2Cl2, both of those subscripts are divisible by two, it should actually be NaCl. So these should always be reduced, okay? And finally, their charges need to equal zero. They need to balance out. So if I have a plus two and a minus one of something, I need two of the negative one things so that everything can balance out to zero when you add them together. Okay, so we're gonna do some examples right here. Let's write the correct formula between the ions of all of these things. Now, remember, we know some of these charges right off the bat by looking at this table. Okay, I also gave you a list of these. <laughs> um, and then there's some, and we'll talk about how to figure out the charge if you don't know what the charge is. So all of these are on that chart. Okay, so calcium is in column two, so it's a plus two. Bromine is in group 7A, so it likes to be minus one. Okay, so for those charges to balance out, I'm going to have one calcium and two bromines, so that that's negative two, so plus two and minus two balance out. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing with the next one. Potassium is plus one. Sulfur is minus two. So I actually need two potassiums for every one sulfur. Okay, now um, I have another method to do this when it starts getting more complicated. It's called the crisscross and reduce method. Okay, so balancing them out always works, but crisscrossing and reduce might save you some time when you get some more complicated things. So I'm going to do that with this one. I got lithium, its charge is plus one. Nitrogen's charge is minus three. So I can look at this and be like, oh, well, obviously I need three lithiums for this to balance out for one nitrogen. Um, so I could write that easily. Or the crisscross or reduced method means this is going to be the subscript of lithium and this is going to be the subscript of nitrogen. So it should be Li3N. Okay, makes it pretty easy. I got aluminum is plus three, oxygen is minus two. If I do my crisscross, It'll be Al2O3. Okay, magnesium plus two, phosphorus minus three. It's gonna be Mg3P2. Okay, simple as that. Now, if they were reducible, you should reduce them. So if it was two and two, they should be reduced to ones, so on and so forth. All right, so that's how you write the formulas. Now on to naming. Okay, they have different nomenclature rules. Okay, that word nomenclature just means naming rules. Okay, um, and we have a very systematic way, systemic rules for naming. So everybody knows what you're talking about when you say the name. Um, so ionic rules, um, remember those are uh, gonna be usually a metal or what's called a polyatomic ion. And I'll talk about those in a sec with a non-metal. Whereas a covalent or a molecular structure is going to be a non-metal with a non-metal. Okay, and there's different rules for naming them. So before you start to try to name something, you have to determine if it is ionic or if it's covalent. So we're gonna do that first. So this example says to determine if you're ionic or covalent. So that means you have to know where the metals are and where the non-metals are. So sodium is in group one, that is a metal. Uh, sulfur is a non-metal, so this one has to be ionic. Okay, phosphorus and chlorine are both non-metals, so this one's going to be covalent. Silicon and hydrogen, silicon is actually a metalloid, so I need to list that here. Covalent molecular can also be metalloids. Okay, so this one's covalent. Iron, that is a transition metal, it's in the middle, so it's a metal and a non-metal, so this one's ionic, and then you should have ionic covalent ionic. Okay, so check and make sure you can find out where those are. Like I said, before you even start to name something, you have to know if it's ionic or covalent. 
Okay, so polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions, let's break this word down, means poly means multiple or many. Atomic would mean atoms. And ion means something with a positive or negative charge. So a polyatomic ion is something that has a positive or negative charge that's made up of multiple atoms. Okay, and that, that's literally what it is. It is one ion composed of two or more elements, and it all together has a net charge. Okay. Now, you don't have to memorize the polyatomic ions. Some of them have weird names. They are on the list that I have linked on um, Canvas. So I would print that page for sure, that in the periodic table, so that you have that handy when you're trying to name things. Um, I know them off the top of my head because I use them all the time. You are probably going to know a lot of them off the top of your head by the end of this class also, but I would print that for now. It's going to be super helpful. So um, polyatomic ions in formulas, you kind of treat them like any other ion. Okay, so you're going to use like any other ion. Okay, you still have to like balance out the charges, make sure they add to zero. Um, but if you need more than one polyatomic ion, it's going to be a little bit different. So for example, up here, I needed two bromine, so I just wrote a little subscript two. Now, if you need multiple of a polyatomic ion, since it has multiple things in it, you have to use parentheses. Okay, use parentheses for more than what? Okay, so if you look at your list, um, for example, I'm going to put together aluminum and nitrate. So aluminum has a charge of plus three from the periodic table. Nitrate is NO3 with a minus one charge. Now, if I put these together, if I'm going to do my little crisscross method, I need three of these and one of these, so it would be Al. And since nitrate is NO3, I'm gonna put it in parentheses and I'm gonna put a little three on the outside. That means I get three of these things, okay? So multiple polyatomic ions, you need to use parentheses. Okay, so onto the naming rules. There's a couple different categories. Um, there's metals with only one charge, okay? That's the metals essentially that are listed in this periodic table right here. So things that don't have different charges. Now, all the blue stuff, they can have multiple charges. So these guys have specific charges all the time, and they are super easy to name. So metals with only one charge, um, which are, I'm going to write here, mostly main group metals, so like the A's. Um, this is how you name them. You literally name your metal. Oops. Okay, the metal's going to be first. And then you're going to name your nonmetal. And you're going to change the ending to IDE. Okay, so whatever that last part of the element is, you're going to chop it off and add IDE. Super easy. Name metal, name the nonmetal IDE. You don't have to worry about the subscripts are. You don't have to worry about um, any of the numbers or anything. Just name metal, name nonmetal IDE. Now, the only time you don't change the IDE is if it's got a polyatomic ion. Okay, so except polyatomics do not change their names. Don't change. Okay, so for example, NO3 is called nitrate. I would just leave that nitrate. I would not change it to ID. That's the only time you don't change it. Okay, now metals with more than one possible charge, for the most part, these are mostly transition metals. So the ones in the middle can have like different charges, right? So they need something extra. So this is how you name these. You name, you still name your metal. And then I'm gonna put parentheses here. We need a little something extra. And then at the end, you're gonna name your non-metal. Again, ID ending, unless it's polyatomic ion. And what we're gonna put right here in parentheses is a Roman numeral that tells us what the charge is, okay? So if it has a charge of plus two, it's gonna have a Roman numeral of two. Okay, and I'm going to show you how to do that here in a minute. And the only way to get good at these is to practice. So there are multiple of these in your homework. Make sure you do your practice. If you need extra practice, go to my website, check them out. So what is the name for these? So these are, you have to check first 
if it's a transition metal or something that has a variable charge or something that has a constant charge. Well, sodium is an alkaline metal. It's in group one. It is always plus one. Um, so it does not have a variable charge. So I'm literally just going to name the metal. And then the nonmetal is bromine. But instead of saying bromine, I'm changing the N to bromide. So this is sodium bromide. All right. I got K2S over here. K, potassium is also an alkali metal. Um, so you better have your periodic table right next to you when you're doing this. Um, it has a plus one charge always. So I can just write potassium sulfide, change the ending to IDE. Okay, try these next two. All right, so I kind of got you there because these are both ones with polyatomic ions. So anything that has more than two elements in it, one of them is probably going to be a polyatomic ion. So you should check your chart of your lists of charges. Okay, so SO4 is sulfate. Hi, if you look on your sheet, it's called sulfate. So this is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium, the so alkaline earth metal, does not have a variable charge. Just magnesium sulfate. This one is lithium phosphate. Again, don't have to worry about the numbers, no variable charge, but BO4 with a minus three charge is called phosphate, okay? Now, these ones are practiced with no Roman numerals. So I'm gonna do A and B over here, or actually I'm gonna do A and C and you guys can try B and D. So A, I've got copper and oxygen. Now copper is a transition metal. If you look at the periodic table, it's in the middle. It can be a plus two or a plus three. It can actually have a couple different charges. So I know I'm gonna have to put a Roman numeral in parentheses, but I'll worry about that in a second. And then the N is gonna be instead of oxygen, oxide, okay? So now what is the charge of copper? Now, I know it has a little two here. That does not mean that that's what it's charges. That means I have two coppers. So remember how we did the crisscross to figure out the charges before? Well, if you reverse the crisscross, you would see that this two was from the oxygen. Oxygen actually has a charge of minus two and copper in this case has a charge of minus one, okay? So essentially the best way to look at these and figure out what this Roman numeral is, is to check the other element and then you can figure out your charge. Check your anion first. So oxygen always has a charge of minus two. So that means in this case, since I have two coppers, each one had to be plus one. So it's copper one oxide. All right, I'm gonna do this one over here. MN is manganese, not to be confused with magnesium. Manganese is a transition metal, so I need to have a Roman numeral. And NO3, notice these parentheses. NO3 then should be on my polyatomic ion chart and it is, it is called nitrate. All right. So what was manganese's charge? Well, I said, check the anion first, right? So nitrate was negative one. And I have two nitrates here. So if I have two nitrates, that means it's negative two. So that must mean magnesium is plus two. Now you could also check the reverse crisscross, right? Two would have gone up there and one would have gone up there. It's manganese two nitrate. So you try the next two and then check your answers. All right, these should be iron three sulfide and cobalt two phosphate. And if you need help finding those charges again, uh, let me or Adara know and we can help you. 